Welcome to our first episode of the Real Estate School podcast. Our guest today is Jesse Vandermeer. Jesse, how are you today? I'm doing very well. How about you? Well, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining us. Jesse, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, I work as a financial analyst at Rocklink Investment Partners. We are a portfolio manager registered in all the major provinces here in Canada. Uh, I work alongside uh, two other analysts here and our CEO, Jonathan Wallam. We, um, as the research team, we're ferreting out new businesses. Uh, we create customized uh, portfolios for clients, separately managed accounts. So our research team um, actively looks for new businesses to add to our client portfolios, typically running them 20 to 30 stocks, um, highly customized and focused and um, kind of looking at all the various industry sectors, including real estate. Okay, that's great. Can you dive a little bit deeper into Rocklink, a little bit of its history and uh, touching on how it's different from its competitors in the wealth management space? Sure. Rocklink was founded in 2010 by Jonathan uh, after he left AIC, uh, now Portland Investment Council. Um, we manage around $250 million in client assets. Like I said, we're a portfolio manager, but we also run two funds, Rocklink Partners Fund and the Rocklink Kokomo Fund, with the latter being domiciled in Cayman Islands. Um, we, our investment philosophy is value investing. That means we're looking for businesses that we can buy at a discount to intrinsic value. We're looking for businesses that uh, have competitive moats. They operate in industries with high secular growth. Um, there's pricing power, inflation hedges, things like that. Um, so we, in addition to our separately managed accounts, we have our funds and um, we have uh, six uh, employees here uh, quickly growing and expanding, which is exciting. And um, we, we differ from competitors um, because we have deeply held convictions that um, are time-tested principles and we do not stray from. Um, this can manifest itself, for example, if we take a look at our governments at the fiscal level and if we look at the monetary policy in major developed economies around the world, we see some pretty uh, outrageous uh, policies, especially in the past couple of years. So what, uh, what we do, for example, for clients, we'll hold uh, a larger amount to, let's say, precious metals, for example, which the average investment manager here in Canada um, does not do. So we have uh, a robust worldview. And from that worldview, uh, we overlay with our investment framework of value investing. And, um, and again, looking to customize uh, concentrated portfolios um, to seek long-term uh, total returns uh, that are above average. Mm -hmm. And speaking of driving returns that are above average for, for your clients, um, I know that they're are a number of REITs um, that are listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange that uh, you have placed some emphasis on um, over the years. Um, and we are speaking about a specific REIT today, about Smart Centers Real Estate Investment Trust. Um, let's dive into that specific trust. Um, are you uh, able to perhaps share some of its history, some of its performance so far? Um, and some top level thoughts around where you see it go um, in the future. Sure. Smart Centers is a very large developer uh, and operator of what they call open air centers or power centers. Uh, they own 88, 188 properties valued at roughly 12 billion. Uh, open air centers, um, Smart Centers, uh, it, has Walmart as its key anchor tenant. So if you think of the Walmart properties, you have Walmart there. And then also typically on the same property, you might have a couple other retail frontages there. So that would be an open air center. And uh, Walmart is Smart Center's largest tenant. They have a relationship going back uh, a few decades now. Mm -hmm. And for example, this one of the reasons we like smart centers is, for example, in COVID, this was a competitive advantage, having um, you know open air frontages uh, that allowed for a little more flexibility during that time. These uh, power centers are typically located at key intersections in highly um, dense areas or key suburban areas. 
And one of the main theses that we have with smart centers too is that it has underutilized land. If you think of all this uh, parking lot space, um, we can actually intensify that land that they already mm -hmm. own. Around 25% is underutilized. So with smart centers, it doesn't actually have to go into the market to purchase more property. It can intensify mm -hmm. its, its own land that it already has. In terms of occupancy, around 98%, which is industry leading uh, with its retail peers, 95% of that is with large regional or national tenants. I uh, think of, uh, you know, the Dollaramas and the Rexalls and so forth. These are very big tenants, investment grade, uh, providing essential services. 65% uh, of, of the tenant revenue is from the essential service space, um, which also adds to its recession proof nature. And the REIT is undergoing around 92 development projects uh, at, the, at this time. So um, not only is it receiving great um, uh, revenue from its key stable national tenants, but it's able to increase the value by developing on its land and has around 92% or 92 projects going at this time. It's also conservatively capitalized. You have just under 4% uh, average weighted uh, interest that it's paying on its debt uh, and with an average duration of four years. So you bring all these characteristics together. It's a key uh, retail or open air retail uh, landlord um, and it's developing uh, on those properties. And then also like some other major REITs here in Canada, you see them go into the residential space. They can develop condos on these properties uh, rental, residential, even retirement homes and storage centers. So um, we like all those aspects uh, together. Looking at its history, Mitchell Goldar, which is its current chairman, has a long relationship with Walmart. As Walmart expanded into Canada um, in the 90s, uh, they struck a relationship and Goldar um, was developing all these key uh, properties for, for Walmart as its tenant anchor. Um, it's smart centers today is a combination between Callaway REIT and, and the smart centers, um, mm -hmm. of the two thousands Callaway bought smart centers in 2015 for around 1.2 billion. And so what you have today is an integrated developer, asset manager, acquirer has all these real estate functions in house, um, mm -hmm. which is also another key competitive advantage. In terms of its performance, if you take a look at uh, since its initial public offering in the early 2000s, it's compounded at an annual rate of around 12.5%. And when you compare that to the TSX capped REIT index, um, it's, it's handily outperformed that and also the TSX composite. So if you invested $100 in 2002 into smart centers and the S&P TSX composite and the capped REIT index, $100 would be around $1,100 today uh, if you bought smart centers and around $600 for the capped REIT. So it's outperformed its peers um, by that extent. Hmm. It's done. It's done well. Yeah. And if you were to reflect on this strong performance that it's had so far, is there anything that someone should pay attention to moving forward that could impact its uh, performance in the coming years? If someone was to be reflecting at this point in time as to whether they're uh, interested in buying this particular REIT Yes, that's that's a good question. Uh, when it comes, you know, the the benefit of having Walmart as your key anchor means tremendous stability. Um, but the real juice in the returns going forward, uh, investors should pay attention specifically to the development uh, closings of its various um, residential uh, developments, office towers, um, like I said, retirement homes, mm -hmm. self storage. So when they're when they bring these projects online, they sell those condo units or rent it out and so forth, and the projects get up and running. Uh, that's when Smart Centers recognizes that mm. revenue and profit, and that's really the juice going forward. 
um, that investors should pay attention to. It's all, always good to pay attention to what they call the same property NOI or looking at the um, organic growth in the net operating income of its current operations. So we'll you know, pay attention to that as well, seeing that it's plodding along at least at the rate of inflation and a little bit more. Uh, but the key metric I would say, and what I look at every quarter as we look at the earnings, is the closing of its various developments. Like I said, they have around 92, so there's a lot going on. They have a lot of real estate professionals that are working hard in terms of zoning, you know, bringing these projects um, online, building construction, all these things. So they have a lot of uh, projects in the air, and as they close on them, um, they recognize the profit at that time. So that's really what's going juice the returns, propel the returns going forward. Okay, that's that's very interesting. Um, I myself, the the work that I do involves commercial and residential real estate, buying, selling, uh, leasing. And most of the people that I'm speaking with on a regular basis are um, invested in the the physical real estate and and the conversation that we're having right now is is going beyond that is looking at if somebody had to had a, a pool of money say they had ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollars uh five hundred thousand dollars that they had in their hand right now and they're making a decision should they be investing those funds in physical real estate or would it be wise to consider having part of um, that mix of funds allocated toward um, real estate investment trusts like smart centers. What are what would be a reason or what would be some of the key factors that someone should consider when they're deciding to potentially allocate part of the funds that they have available toward um, uh, a real estate investment trust um, as opposed to holding those funds in uh, in, in a physical asset? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's pros and cons to both the public and private markets when it comes to real estate. Um, as in most portfolio management, it's a, it's important to diver diversify. Most investors will have their diversi diversification to the private market in their own home, typically. Um, and of course, that's one uh, primary uh, key uh, exposure that they have and key component of building wealth. Um, I mean, it's the American and Canadian dream. It has driven um, the uh, construction of uh, personal wealth over time. So since you have exposure in a way to, in a private market to real estate um, in that manner, I think it is helpful having it uh, exposure in the public markets as well. So we, REITs are a key component, um, the primary vehicle to do so in the public markets. There's, there's a lot of benefits that come to uh, public market real estate investing. Uh, if you think of REITs, it, the first the first advantage that comes to mind is low transaction costs. I mean, most people today have their investment accounts, TFSA, RSP, self directed self directed accounts, and for you know seven ninety nine, you can allocate a couple hundred thousand to real estate real estate exposure in the public markets. So that's a very low transaction cost where typically, of course, the private markets will have a higher transaction cost. So that's the first benefit of the public market. The second one that is uh, connected to that is also liquidity. Um, you know, from 9.30 to 4 p.m. each day, the markets are open and at any point you can sell your holdings. Um, so there's tremendous liquidity at a low transaction cost. Um, now, typically, and we advise our clients with any stock or any industry, I mean, you hold it for the long term. So it's not that you should be buying and selling day by day. But if you do have that need, if something comes up, if there's an emergency and you have to liquidate some of your assets, you can do that quite easily. So the second advantage is, is liquidity. The third advantage you could say is ease of ownership. Um, again, these are all somewhat connected, but um, so for a couple hundred thousand, you can quickly um, have exposure to some REITs, um, exposure to the underlying real estate assets, and you don't really have to do much. Um, you know, if you're a physical uh, owner of real estate properties and you're the landlord, I mean, 
you know, some landlords have that 2 a.m. call to come fix the plumbing or unclog a drain. So there's, and you can also outsource that, that as well, but there is still that more hands-on ownership aspect. Whereas when you own a REIT, um, you don't really do anything. You just kind of sit back and collect the dividend. So it's the ease of ownership um, is also the third competitive advantage. And then the fourth is uh, volatility. Well, that is typically a negative. Um, I mean, the when you own your house, when you own some um, uh, physical real estate um, directly in the private markets, you have lower volatility. And that is a good thing. So when I mention volatility in the public markets, it can be a good thing because as we see right now, you can have periods of time which investors uh, sell real estate assets uh, below intrinsic value. And that right. offers an opportunity for investors to buy real estate at attractive values. And typically the public markets will show more volatility than, than the private markets. And volatility is an opportunity if, if you have the ability um, and the discipline to take advantage. So um, I would say those four main components are some advantages of, of owning real estate in the public markets through REITs. There's more, um, but those are the four that come to come to my mind. All right. Thank you. If you were speaking today with someone who is holding $10,000 or $100,000 or a million dollars in their hand, and they're about to make a buy or uh, hold or sell decision um, around Smart Center's Real Estate Investment Trust. What would your thoughts be on that? Assuming that uh, when you look at their entire household um, wealth across investment accounts and even in the private market, let's say even their own household and so forth, and they have an underexposure to real estate, I think that when it comes to Smart Center's, we would recommend buying. I mean, we're buying it for our clients. Um, so the short answer is yes. Uh, smart centers, at, at, especially at these levels, is a buy. I mean, reviewing our thesis of why we like the business as a business, you have, again, Walmart as the key tenant anchor, which drives tremendous stability and results in top line. Um, and then the intensification and development thesis. Smart centers does not have to go out and buy land. There are some... Uh, REITs out there, some in different sectors that uh, sometimes are forced to either sell or buy land at inopportune times. And uh, Smart Centers has a surplus of land, which it has actually over the past uh, few quarters been taking advantage of properties that are trading at lower cap rates, uh, just able to realize pretty good value for those properties. Um, so not only can it sell land at opportune times, but it does not, it does not have to buy land. Um, to develop. It can just intensify its current land holding, which obviously brings down the cost as well. And these development activities are immense. If you're looking at the entire value of the business, there's around a $2 billion development pipeline um, that given the current uh, levels it's trading in the market for, the market is not ascribing any dollar amount to this development pipeline. So you're getting smart centers at a fair price and then a complete $2 billion development pipeline for free, so to speak. Um, so it has tremendous development activities in its pipeline that, that will drive value in future years. And then it's conservatively capitalized. Um, like I said, it's weighted average interest rate on its debt is just below 4%. And it's weighted average, what they call duration or length um, of their debt is around four years. Only 13% of its uh, debt is up for refinancing in the next two years, which is a relatively low sum. So um, it's, it's able to um, go to the capital markets at favorable terms. I think around these levels, if you look at where it's trading around $24, $25 um, in the markets, this is definitely a, an attractive value. Um, if we do an internal cal calculation of its NAV, net asset value, um, essentially it's assets minus its liabilities, um, and then you're left with the equity. If you take a look at its NAV, we calculate the NAV to be just under $30. So it's trading around 24, 25, 
And that's with a 7.7% forward dividend yield, uh, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, we calculate its NAV to be just under 30. So given those two factors and given the thesis around the business, um, we're definitely uh, buyers at these levels. I would mm -hmm. recommend someone that needs exposure to real estate um, and specifically public um, real estate uh, vehicle, that smart centers is a fantastic way to gain that exposure. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. This was a very insightful conversation. Um, if um, our listeners are interested in connecting with you, um, if they have any questions about um, what we're discussing today around smart centers, or if they would like to invest with Rockling, how can they connect with you? The best way would uh, check out our website, rocklink.com, R-O-C-L-I-N-C.com. There you'll find all our individual contact information. You, you can also take a look at our newsletters. We produce a quarterly newsletter. Um, and you can check out our other videos and podcasts that we've done uh, that we've done before, and uh, you can really get an insight into our investment philosophy, how we approach investing, and uh, what we do here. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Alex.